morning, folks. A very warm welcome, or at least as warm as we can possibly muster up in the barn here. Uh, I'd love to see you all on this uh, last day of Unleavened Bread, and I hope you've had a good week. I hope you've managed to keep away from leaven. I know we get into a bit of a fuss about what we eat, but the most important thing about this whole week is replacing sin with righteousness. You know, that's what we should be aiming for in our lives. And not just this week, but all our lives. So uh, we will have, of course, a, a service today. Uh, we're going to be blowing the shofars. Dave is going to be reading from Second Chronicles. It's a lovely story. Hopefully you've all got your Bibles about young King Josiah. And, uh, and I've, I've got a message thereafter. And of course, we have a feast, physical feast, which is always a lovely thing to eat amongst friends, uh, especially on a very important day as today. So we look forward to that especially. And it's also an opportunity for special items of any sort, whether it be musical or something somebody wants to say or whatever it might be. So we'll look forward to that as well. Sadly, Mother's not with us today. She's not feeling too great, so she's better at home keeping warm and cosy in her own home at the moment. So no doubt uh, Esther and David will have a look in later on. Okay, let's begin with uh, a few choruses and happy choruses. Although Christ died in the beginning of this week, he lives, he, he rose, uh, and he lives uh, with his Father and at the right hand right now. And that gives us all great hope as we get older and death approaches. Uh, death has lost its sting because we have the wonderful example of our Saviour who rose from the dead. So let's uh, let's have a chorus or two. Uh, I'll better pick the first one. Eh? Uh, let's think. In fact, I'll, I'll ask Esther to pick uh, since I'm not quite ready. Uh, one, zero, two. One, zero, two. <coughs> Now we've got two little ones with us today, uh, Jessica and uh, Theodore, Teddy. What's wrong? Uh, so, no, 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 I'm not going to ask you, I'm going to tell you what you're singing. Uh, my God is so big, okay? Uh, I'll do the actions. My God.
some good attention here and there. I always pick the wrong time when they're getting fed. Do you have to feed them during choruses? You cannot wait. Just five minutes. Huh? Goodness me. All right. Any others? Children's ones? I'm sure we'll come back to that later. Maybe that's a good idea. Okay. Who would like to join? Yes. Sorry. No, no. I'll, ladies first. Gordon will be patient. That's fine. Could I have one My peace I give to you. Yes, lovely. <coughs> Oh, very good. Sing hallelujah to the Lord. Perfect chorus for today. for this morning. <clears throat> 144. Which is 
choice. We now have perhaps another one bit to finish. What about uh, Theodore? Is he looking for his chorus yet? No? <coughs> oh, we'll give it a go, shall we? Running over.
Okay, shall we finish at that? He was looking and paying attention, so that's good. Excellent. Sorry, darling, you're going to say something? Yeah, okay, you pick one more. What about Abba Father, the first one? Yeah. Number one, Abba Father, let me be. All the ladies perhaps sing it through. First of all. Thank you all for your choices. Let's begin our service proper with hymn number 121. Thine be the glory, ever conquering Son. Thine be the glory. <coughs>
Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for this wonderful privilege of assembling together to honour and worship thy name and also to celebrate this uh, high day, this uh, last day of unleavened bread, this celebration of freedom from sin itself. <coughs> we thank you for this hope. We thank you that through the blood and the sacrifice of our Saviour, we have such a wonderful future to look forward to. We know that we stand before thee as sinful uh, people, instinctively wrongdoing, but through the intercession of our High Priest and Saviour Jesus Christ, we be made whole and have audience with thee. We thank you for your love toward us and your infinite mercy. We thank you that you continue to protect us from all manner of harm and danger. We thank you for your provisions, both spiritual and spiritual. We thank you for your Holy Spirit that dwells within us, that binds us together as one and one with thee. We thank you for your word that we can access so easily. We thank you that we can study together and learn and grow spiritually, that our relationship with thee will become more and more intimate and meaningful for ourselves and for those that we have contact with. We pray for your church worldwide, especially those who aim to celebrate this feast day. We thank you that we are not alone, that even when we are a small group, your Holy Spirit is with us. We pray for those who suffer in, the, in thy name. May they be uplifted, especially on this day. And all those who turn to thee, may their prayers be answered in accordance with thy will. And so we dedicate this service to thee and your holiness, thanking you for all things and worshipping thy name. For this we ask through the blood of the Lamb and for your glory. Amen. 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 Before David uh, commences his, the reading from Chronicles, we're going to blow the shofars. Uh, of course, to many people, in fact, I would say most people, the shofar is a strange thing to do. To blow the noise it makes is not particularly tuneful. But throughout the Bible, we see... Uh, uh, records of, of this instrument being used to herald great events and you know in the days to come when Christ returns to this earth uh, the great trumpets of God and his son will be blowing and reverberate throughout the world so uh, uh, yeah they are, it is significant so um, we'll do it I think I made a mistake last time three times then a long one okay. <coughs> quite blend together, did it? But um, never mind. Right, I'll leave you the reading, Dave. <coughs> so, as you've been uh, already told, uh, the reading this morning is from Second Chronicles chapter 34. <coughs> Second Chronicles chapter 34. Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign, and he reigned in Jerusalem one and thirty years. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, and walked in the ways of David his father, and declined neither to the right hand nor to the left. For in the eighth year of his reign, while he was yet young, he began to seek after, God, after the God of David his father. And in the twelfth year, he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem from the high places and the groves and the carved images and the molten images. And he break down the altars of Balaam in his presence 
And the images that were on high above them, he cut down, and the groves, and the carved images, and the molten images, he break in pieces, and made dust of them, and strewed it upon the graves of them that had sacrificed unto them. And he burnt the bones of the priests upon the altars, and cleansed Judah and Jerusalem. And so did he in the cities of Manasseh, and Ephraim, and Simeon, even unto Naphtali, with their mattocks round about. And when he had broken down the altars and the groves, and had beaten the graven images into powder, and cut down all the idols throughout all the land of Israel, he returned to Jerusalem. Now in the eighteenth year of his reign, when he had purged the land and the house, he sent Shaphan, the son of Azaliah, and Masaiah, the governor of the city, and Joah, the son of Johazah, the recorder, to repair the house of the Lord his God. And when they came to Hilkiah, the high priest, they delivered the money that was brought into the house of God, which the Levites that kept the doors had gathered of the land of Manasseh and Ephraim. And of all the remnant of Israel, and of all Judah and Benjamin, and they returned to Jerusalem. And they put it in the hand of the workmen that had the oversight of the house of the Lord. And they gave it to the workmen that wrought in the house of the Lord to repair and amend the house. Even to the artificers and builders gave they it to buy hewn stone and timber for couplings and to floor the houses which the kings of Judah had destroyed. And the men did the work faithfully, and the overseers of them were Jehath and Obadiah, the Levites of the sons of Merari, and Zechariah and Meshulam of the sons of the Korathites, to set it forward, and other of the Levites, all that could skill of instruments of music. Also they were over the bearers of burdens and were overseers of all that wrought the work in any manner of service. And of the Levites, they were scribes and officers and porters. And when they had brought out the money that was brought into the house of the Lord, Hilkiah the priest found a book of the law of the Lord given by Moses. And Hilkiah answered and said to Shaphan, the scribe, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah delivered the book to Shaphan. And Shaphan carried the book to the king and brought the king word back again, saying, All that was committed to thy servants, they do it. <coughs> And they that were gathered together, and they that and they have gathered together the money that was found in the house of the Lord, and have delivered it into the hand of the overseers, and to the hand of the workmen. Then Shaphan the scribe told the king, saying, Hilkiah the priest has given me a book, and Shaphan read it before the king. And it came to pass when the king had heard the words of the law that he rent his clothes. And the king commanded Hilkiah and Hekayim, the son of Shaphan, and Abdon, the son of Micah, and Shaphan, the scribe, and Isaiah, a servant of the king, saying, Go, inquire of the Lord for me and for them that are left in Israel and in Judah concerning the words of the book that is found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is poured out upon us, because our fathers have not kept the word of the Lord, to do after all that is written in this book. And Hilkiah and they that the king had appointed went to Huldah, the prophetess, the wife of Shulam, the son of Tikvath, the son of Hashra, the keeper of the wardrobe, now she dwelt in Jerusalem in the college, 
And they spake to her to that effect. And she answered them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Tell ye the man that sent you to me, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will bring evil upon this place, and upon the inhabitants thereof, even all the curses that are written in the book, which they have read before the king of Judah, because they have forsaken me, and have burned incense unto other gods, that they might provoke me to anger with all the works of their hands. Therefore my wrath shall be poured out upon this place, and shall not be quenched. And as for the king of Judah, who sent you to inquire of the Lord, so shall you say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, concerning the words which thou hast heard, Because thine heart was tender, and thou didst humble thyself before God, when thou heardest his words against this place, and against the inhabitants thereof, and humblest thyself before me, and dost rend thy clothes, and weep before me, I have even heard thee also, saith the Lord. Behold, I will gather thee to thy fathers, and thou shalt be gathered to thy grave in peace. Neither shall thine eyes see all the evil that I will bring upon this place, and upon the inhabitants of the same. So they brought the king word again. Then the king sent and gathered together all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem. And the king went up into the house of the Lord, and all the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and the priests and the Levites, and all the people, great and small. And he read in their ears all the words of the book of the covenant that was found in the house of the Lord. And the king stood in his place and made a covenant before the Lord to walk after the Lord and to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all his heart and with all his soul to perform the words of the covenant which are written in this book. And he caused all that were present in Jerusalem and Benjamin to stand to it. And the inhabitants of Jerusalem did according to the covenant of God, the God of their fathers. And Joash and Josiah took away all the abominations out of all the countries that pertained to the children of Israel and made all that were present in Israel to serve, even to serve the Lord their God. And all his days they departed not from following the Lord, the God of their fathers. Amen. Thank you, Dave. It's quite a story. This young man, <coughs> 18 years old, suddenly just being presented the book of the law and after reading it, humbled himself and cleansed the church, cleansed his people and made it quite clear this is what they had to do follow the law of God. And that all happened during this week, this Passover week, all those years ago. So it's quite a story, and I'm going to touch at that on that in a little while. But let's have another hymn, which is 722, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. 722. Thank you. 
needing some help, I think. <coughs> <coughs> Everyone's coughing and spluttering. Yeah. Never mind. <coughs> You'll notice, by the way, the only person that's not getting any heat is myself. <laughs> yeah. I'm absolutely frozen standing here, let me tell you. <laughs> Never mind. I don't mind at all. Uh, okay. So today, today we've reached the last day of Unleavened Bread. Uh, we've spent a week, and a few days before that, it's all a busy time for women folk, whoever's looking after the, the uh, foodstuffs and cupboards and whatever else is in the cupboards, just to check there's nothing lying around. Uh, and uh, I remember many, many years ago when, when we were doing up the old house that we had, and uh, we're coming to the end of Unleavened Bread, and I looked in the fireplace, uh, and I wasn't such a tidy person then, and here one of the kids had just thrown a half-eaten roll of something or other, you know, in, in the fire. And, I'm, and of course, you know, but that's, that's life, isn't it? Things, things go unnoticed. And, uh, and it's like sin. You think, oh, well, that's okay. Uh, and it's only when you think about it, you think, well, I should, really shouldn't have done that or said that. But we have spent a week ensuring that there's no leaven, no yeast in our food and in our homes. Uh, so it's been a week of concentration and watchfulness. And, uh, you know, you, you take special extra care in what you've been, you're eating uh, which isn't so bad when you're in your own home, but when you're out and about, uh, uh, this, we've had family over, Debbie and the little ones, so when you're out and about, you have to even, be even more careful. <laughs> and I'm sure most of you, or some of you at least, will be glad it's all over and you can go back to your normal routine and go down to the baker's and get a nice fresh loaf of bread uh, <coughs> or some cakes and whatever you like to eat. We're, we're very big cake eaters. Uh, Debbie commented on that. Uh, you know, Scottish people like to eat sort of all their own things. Uh, but, but before we do that, we just we have to wait. And uh, let's never forget what really this, because sometimes we can be, get overboard about, you know, what we're eating and all the rest of it. There's, but there's much more to this whole week. Uh, so let's look at what the symbolism is truly about. First of all, it's about salvation. And, you know, there's no point in uh, kidding on being a Christian unless you understand salvation, what it is and where we get salvation from. And we get salvation through the blood of the Passover lamb. Jesus died for us, our Messiah, Yeshua, the Messiah. He died from, for us, for all humanity. Everyone in this room and everyone, God loves everyone. You know, and, and many, many uh, sects of Christianity consider themselves to be, you know, we're the chosen ones. But God doesn't think that way. All humanity is important to God. The next thing we have to think about is holiness. And where do we get holiness? We get holiness through the power of his blood. Uh, and that allows total exclusion from our lives uh, of leaven. Which And what does leaven represent? It represents sin. It represents hypocrisy and falsehood. And uh, things that we're all guilty of. Every single one of us. And then finally, the seven day week which represents eternity. Uh, and, and that is vital also. It's our, it's our, it's our sign. It's our link yes. with, with our creator, the seven-day week, which represents eternity. So, keeping this week of unleavened bread it has been a declaration of our faith in Jesus, the Lamb of God, who came to save his people from their sins. For all time. That's from Matthew. So I'm going to quickly go back to the chapter we read twice in the last uh, week. First of all on Passover evening and again on the first day of unleavened bread. And it's from Exodus 12. And this is uh, the, uh, 
the very first Passover, way back in time uh, when uh, Israel was about to finish their captivity in Egypt. So we'll read a few verses from Exodus chapter 12, from verse 13 to 20. And, uh, and here we have uh, the very first Passover being described. <clears throat> verse 13. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. And this day shall be unto you for a memorial. And you shall keep it a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. You shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. Seven days shall ye eat unleavened bread. Even the first day ye shall put away leaven out of your houses. For whosoever eateth leavened bread from the first day until the seventh day, that soul shall be cut off from Israel. And in the first day there shall be an holy convocation. And in the seventh day there shall be an holy convocation to you. No manner of work shall be done in them, save that which every man must eat. That only may be done of you. And you shall observe the feast of unleavened bread. For in this selfsame day have I brought your armies out of the land of Egypt. Therefore shall you observe this day in your generations <clears throat> by an ordinance forever. In the first month, on the fourteenth day of the month at even, you shall eat unleavened bread until the one and twentieth day of the month at even. Seven days shall there be no leaven found in your houses. For whosoever eateth that which is leavened, even that soul shall be cut off from the congregation of Israel, whether he be a stranger or born in the land. He shall eat nothing leavened. In your habitations shall ye eat unleavened bread. So there's no doubt about it. We're told for this period, this week, not to go anywhere near anything with leaven in it. And it repeats. You know something's important in the Bible when it's repeated. You've got this passage and it repeats it two or three times just to get it into your thick skulls. <laughs> uh, so there we are. That's that first account. Now, we live, obviously, in this world, this ever-changing world. And uh, I'm now 65 years old. And when I think back to when I was a teenager, how things have changed since then. And there's a few few uh, of my fellow congregation, a little bit older than me, too, who can also remember things that uh, would since, you know, are gone from days gone by. And, uh, you know, this world is a world in which signs and symbols uh, are used every day and without them communication between individuals would be very difficult uh, when we were little you know i can remember learning the alphabet when you're a wee tiny child uh and no doubt uh will jessica be learning the alphabet yet darling is that begin to happen no not really no uh, certainly uh, within a couple of years she's listening she's part so, uh, yeah, we, we all remember the, learning the alphabet and learning to that communication, how to read and to write. And uh, a, a letter, each letter <laughs> is a sign or a symbol representing a sound. <laughs> and then, uh, you know, when you look at people who live in the, mil or in the military, you know, they salute uh, various signals. Uh, if you're in the Navy, flags uh, on the ship will represent... Uh, some sort of command or instruction. Uh, hand signals also. If I'm out on some of my old motorbikes, I don't have any electronic stuff, so I, I have to put out my hand, you know, and have a look behind my shoulder just to make sure nobody's, so somebody can see me. I say, look, I'm turning right here. You know, just don't, don't come anywhere near me just now. So, and then of course, we have these. This is a symbol. This ring here. Uh... I lost my first one building a house somewhere. Uh, this is the second ring. But uh, it's a symbol of, of being married to my wife. Uh, so, uh, and it's never ending. It's a symbol of eternity, which is a lovely thing. Uh, and then some people wear badges, you know, in their jackets. 
um, to represent what club or uh, organisation they belong to. And then we have flags. The flag of Great Britain, the Union Jack, uh, represents the country that we live in. And, uh, and then, of course, we're in this password, uh, what do you call it, computer age now. <laughs> so um, we need passwords to get into our, your computer and when you're linking up to some organization and they want you to sign up, you have to give them a password and, and so on and so forth. And I'm not forgetting our signature. Everyone has their own signature, uh, which is also very important. So, uh, signs, symbols, uh, and of course, when you learn to drive, uh, we all remember sitting at a driving test and passing the driving test. It's a wonderful experience. Uh, but before you can do that, you have to learn the road, road uh, trap, you know, what do you call it, the, the, the rule of the road and uh, all the symbols on the road, all the colored lines and all the different signs that you see, different colors of signs, what they mean. I probably couldn't pass my driving test now. I have no idea what half this stuff means. Far too many signs now. But, uh, but yeah, to drive on the road, you need to be f familiar with the, the rules of the road. And if you don't, then disaster will strike. But far more important to all this are signs of the times. And, uh, you know, as Christians, we've been talking about signs of the times for a long, long time, you could say. Uh, when I got to know the Lochran family and sitting chatting to my father-in-law, uh, he would talk about the time of trouble and preparation for that, uh, preparing for the end time. Uh, and uh, he was very clear that if you fail to recognize the signs of the times, then it, it becomes like spiritual illiteracy. You know, you're not doing your job as a Christian. You have to be aware of what's, <laughs> what new developments are coming along. Because if you don't, then... Uh, you will be asleep when Christ comes and think, what's happening here? I wasn't expecting this. Matthew 24 says this, verse 3, tell us these, the, Christ is talking to his disciples and uh, they asked him, when will these things be? What will be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And the Savior's reply was, there shall be wars, Famines, disease epidemics, natural disasters, faithlessness in the church, broken homes, sexual license. Well, all this is happening on a worldwide scale. What else can we look for? Anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism has been going on for thousands of years. And again, once again, it's on the rise big style. Uh, we see what's happening right now. Jewish people are uh, cannot walk in the streets without fearing for violence against them. <coughs> and anti-Semitism is evidence of the spirit of Satan at work because Satan, Lucifer, hates Israel. Hates Israel because they are the chosen people of God. And he hates them with a diabolical hatred. What else can we look for? Distress on earth. And there's so much. I mean, the, the world is a beautiful place. There are many lovely things. David and Carl are back from a trip down, in the, down under, as they call it, Australia, New Zealand, and all these places. And they've had a wonderful time. And, of course, it is easy to ferret around and have a nice holiday and not see the anger and despair and distress that is going on around the world because we do have much distress, much despair, and much worry about the future that people are having to go through. Despite all this, the gospel is going on, going and reaching to all corners of the world. The internet and uh, the uh, technology that we all take for granted now is, is making sure of that. And China, of all places, it has, has, has the fastest growing uh, growth of Christianity in the world at this moment in time. 
And in addition to all this, we have to look up into the skies because there are going to be celestial signs, signs in the heavens and the sun and the moon and the stars. Let's go back to Genesis. Uh, Genesis chapter 1 uh, reminds us our, our, and, and gives us a lesson here when he is talking about his creation. And Genesis chapter 1 verse 14, God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. So God's making it clear, yes, these celestial bodies are there uh, to divide the day from the night for seasons, for days, for years. You know, David works out the calendar on the basis of uh, all the various movements of the celestial bodies. But God also says, let them be for signs. Luke 21, verse 10. Uh, again, it's uh, Luke's version of Matthew 24. Then he said unto them, Nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and great earthquakes will be in diverse places, and famines and pestilences and fearful sights, and great sights shall there be from heaven. Great signs shall there be from heaven. So yes, there will be unusual events taking place. And then, of course, Revelation. Also, uh, Revelation chapter 6. Beheld, uh, this is the, the, the opening of the seals. The sixth seal. Uh, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair. The moon became as blood. And the stars of heavens fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man, hid themselves in the dens and in the, rock, and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come. Who shall be able to stand? So here we're looking towards uh, some momentous events that will happen in this old world of ours. Joel, also uh, a prophet who talks about great wonders and things happening. Joel chapter 3, verse 30. I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord shall come. So great events which have still to happen and they're going to be witnessed by everyone. So we have to be aware that uh, these things are going to happen. Another thing that will happen uh, is uh, the uprising of information, false information. And of course, we live in the world of the internet now and YouTube and so on, and you know, you have so much information now. You can sit all day just going from one thing to another, and uh, it's, some of it is presented so plausibly, so cleverly, so polished. The uh, production quality and uh, it's just incredible, and you think, wow, that's amazing. But all too often, it's a lie. Matthew 24, verse 24 says, For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and they shall show great signs and wonders, inasmuch as if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. So that's happening. White signs and mir miracles and all sorts of incredible statements. Uh, false prophets in the Christian church. It's happening now. People are being led astray. And that that 
prophecy is being fulfilled before our eyes right now. So we have to be careful. Be careful what you're being prompted to watch or read or uh, get involved in. Uh, and, uh, and, and always, you know, Isaiah, Isaiah uh, 8, verse 20 says this, and this is something that we have to uh, bear in mind very carefully. Whenever we read something, or watch something. Uh, and this is an important verse to balance against. And it says this, To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. So bear that wee verse in mind uh, when you're uh, looking at something that sounds amazing. Because, you know, there are, there are some very good speakers out there with charisma, with drama, uh, they just know how to nail the point through. Uh, and uh, again, we have to be careful. And of course, we, we look uh, ahead, we have uh, the beast coming along the scene. Uh, and uh, Revelation 13, 13 says this, He doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down in the sight of men, and deceiveth them that dwell on earth by means of miracles which he hath power to do in the sight of the beast. These are the spirits of devils working miracles. Second Thessalonians 2 verse 9, uh, Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders. So there's so much that we have to be careful of in this modern age. All of us. It, because any one of us could be duped. Next thing is signs of faith. Now, when understood and correctly applied, the Bible lists divine, several divine signs which are symbolic signs of faith. And they go far beyond all other signs and point to that believer's inner conviction and love for the Almighty. The first thing is the weekly Sabbath. You know, the weekly Sabbath is so important. And uh, it's so sad that people now have kind of alternative views about this uh, where, you know, they, they, they seem to think that the weekly Sabbath that the Jewish people, the people of Israel have been keeping since time immemorial is not actually the Sabbath. How wrong they are. The weekly Sabbath is a divinely appointed sign of sanctification between God of Israel and his people. Is Exodus chapter 31, verse 13 says, It, the Sabbath, is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. Ezekiel 20, verse uh, 12 says, Moreover, also I gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between me and them that they might know that I am the Lord that doth sanctify them. That Sabbath hasn't changed. There is no way God would allow his Sabbath to be lost over, the, over, over this period of time. So the weekly Sabbath is vital. And don't let anyone suggest to you that uh, it doesn't really matter what day you keep, because it does. And of course, another sign is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. This, this, uh, this particular week, and this last day of unleavened bread is an eternal sign on, first of all, on the hand, because it, what you do with your hands represents your actions. And what happens within this brain of yours represents your beliefs. And uh, by keeping this feast, you're... you're uh, Presenting to God that you are doing your best to be obedient and to be a child of God. As I mentioned at the beginning, believers do their best to put all traces of leaven out of their homes, out of their diet. It's an annual declaration that the believer wants 
God to enter that person and get rid of sin and hypocrisy and false doctrine out of their mind. So this week is a sign of sanctification and holiness. And Exodus 13, 9 says, And it, this feast of unleavened bread, shall be for a sign upon thee, upon thine hand, for a memorial and for a memorial between thine eyes. In other words, what goes on in your brain, that the Lord's law may be in thy mouth. So, the Feast of Unleavened Bread is such an important sign. Now, if we fail to recognize all these signs, this, whether it's the signs in society or the signs in the heavens or the signs in the church, it uh, it's, it's, could, could well be catastrophic. Because it could result in us all being hopelessly deceived. <coughs> and if you become deceived, then the chances are that you'll lose eternal life. Let's consider what happened long ago when Israel failed to recognize the signs of the times. Matthew chapter 16 verse 3 says this, And in the morning it will be foul weather today, for the sky is red and lowering. O oh, ye hypocrites, you can discern the face of the sky, but can ye not discern the signs of the times? Luke chapter 19, this is when Christ was approaching Jerusalem. He's approaching Jerusalem. You can imagine. This is from ver uh, chapter 19, four verses, 41 to 44. And when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it, saying, If thou hadst known, even thou, at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. Thine enemies shall cast a trench about thee and shall lay thee even with the ground and thy children within thee, because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. Basically, Christ is saying, look at you, you fail to recognize. You fail to recognize me. I've come to be your Messiah. They blindly put him to death. And of course, the repercussions of that colossal blunder has resulted in the death of millions down the centuries. Because Matthew 27, 25 then answered all the people when they were given the choice to save Jesus from death. Uh, Pilate says, what will I do? There's nothing, I can see nothing wrong with him. His blood be on us and on our children, they answered. And that's exactly what has happened. But of course, that doesn't mean the Christian church is any better than ancient Israel. You know, we're full of believers who are, are not really convinced. You know, they're all uh, asking God for miracles to sort out their own personal doubts. And that indicates that spiritual adultery has become the norm. And the Bible describes Christians who keep asking God for signs as a faithless and adulterous generation. Mark chapter 8, verse 11 to 12. The Pharisees came forth and began to question with him, seeking of him a sign from heaven, tempting him. And he sighed deeply in his spirit and said, Why does this generation seek after a sign? Verily I say, verily I say unto you, there shall be no sign be given unto this generation. And likewise, Matthew chapter 12, verse 38 to 39. And, uh, you know, the disciples are saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. 
What we should be doing is uh, imitating the example set by that young king, Josiah of Judah. David read the story earlier. This young man came to the throne at the age of eight. Eight years old. And ten years later, at the age of 18, oh no, 26, he was, it was the 18th year of his reign, so he was 26, beg your pardon. Still a young man, 26 years old. Josiah, uh, in this reading that uh, David read, organized the greatest Passover celebration ever to be held to that day. And highlights of the occasion are, if I'll read a few verses, uh, 2 Chron Chronicles 34, verses uh, 19 to 21. And it came to pass, when the king had heard the words of the law, that he rent his clothes. And the king commanded Hilkiah and Ahikam, the son of Shaphan, and Abdon, the son of Micah, and Shaphan, the scribe, and Isaiah, a servant of the king, saying, Go, inquire of the Lord for me and for them that are left in Israel and in Judah concerning the words of the book that is found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is poured up out upon us because our fathers have not kept the word of the Lord to do after all that is written in this book. So the wisdom of this young man at the age of 26, after being presented with the book of the law, he thought, my goodness, what have we done? What have we done? Is it too late? I need to ask God uh, to please forgive us. We know when something is so very important in the Bible, when it's repeated uh, in, in different places, and the story of uh, King Josiah is also re uh, to be found in Kings, Second Kings, and in Second Kings twenty three, uh, we see also a more detailed version of what Josiah did during this very special Passover week. Verse four, he uh, destroyed all the vessels used in Baal worship. Verse 5, he dismissed all the priests who worshipped the starry host, worshipped the stars, astrology, you know. This is a big thing nowadays, huge thing. You know, you get astrology parties now, and everyone goes along, and what's, what's my future? <clears throat> Verse 6, the burning of Asherah. Asherah was the, the wooden pole, huge wooden pole which stood at the Canaanite places of worship because the, you know, the Israelites had adopted all this pagan worship. It probably was originally like a, a tall trunk of a tree with all the branches chopped off so it would stand tall and uh, it was like a wooden symbol of the goddess Asherah. Asherah. Uh, who like Ashtoreth was a type, it was, like, it was all about fertility. Verse 7, Josiah demolished the houses of the Sodomites. You know, we live in a world where, uh, you know, anything goes. But you can be certain that sodomy, which is homosexuality, is a grievous sin in the eyes of God. And a lot of modern translations have removed the word sodomite from their renderings, so take note of that too. In verse 11, he destroyed all the trappings of sun worship and the altar king Jeroboam had erected many, many years before. And then he destroyed the high places in the presence of this evil priesthood, the wayward priesthood, and then he later wiped them out too burning their bones, burning being symbolic of eternal destruction. 2 Kings 23, verse 21 to 22, And the king commanded all the people, saying, Keep the Passover unto the Lord your God, as it is written in the book of this covenant. Surely, verse 22, 
there was not holden such a Passover from the days of the judges that judged Israel or in all the days of the kings of Israel, nor of the kings of Judah. So the most wonderful and true and proper Passover ever kept up to that time. Oh, and he also got rid of spiritism. 2 Kings 23, 24 to 25. Moreover, the workers with familiar spirits, the wizards and the images and the idols and all the abominations that were spied in the land of Judah and in Jerusalem did Josiah put away, that he might perform the words of the law which were written in the book that Hilkiah the priest found in the house of the Lord. And like unto him, there was no king before him that turned to the Lord with all his heart and with all his soul and with all his might, according to all the law of Moses. Neither after him arose there any like him. And he did all this, Josiah. He began this purge during the Passover week of unleavened bread. And that's really significant. Because that young king was doing exactly what this week of unleavened bread signifies. He was getting rid of leaven, the sin, the hypocrisy, all the pagan worship out of Israel. But even that was just a shadow. Because all that amazing stuff that he did, uh, which was massive, real, it was real. It was, it was just an illustration and a shadow of the work of a king far greater than Josiah, King Yeshua. And when Yeshua, the king of kings, returns to take up the throne of David, the greatest Passover of all time will most definitely be observed and a much more permanent form of cleansing will be accomplished. So Josiah was a forerunner uh, of King Yeshua, who is the saviour and redeemer of mankind. Remember too, of course, Paul reminds us that of these great stories of old when he says in 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 10 verse 11, now all these things happened unto them for examples. And they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. The words of Paul. So, to round up this message today, uh, the week of unleavened bread, which we've coming, is coming to an end now, but the week of unleavened bread, it stands for holiness. It stands for commitment. <clears throat> and not just a kind of commitment, total commitment to Yahweh, the Lord God of Israel. Remember the instructions given to Israel uh, via Moses. Deuteronomy 6, verse 5. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. That's what God expects of us. Verse 6, 7, and 8. Then these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. Thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house and when thou walkest by the way and when thou liest down and when thou risest up and thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. So what does that say? It says to us that as believers, uh, we mustn't just come along and serve God kind of just because that's what we do. But you've got to serve God with commitment, total commitment, with your heart, all your heart, with your soul and your mind. And, uh, and not just do it, you know, this week of unleavened bread, but do it all your lives every day. That's what God expects of us. And of course, we fail miserably, all of us. 
Matthew also 22, 37, the Jesus' word said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. So Jesus himself repeating these words. Uh, again, emphasizing what we must be. John 17, verse 4, I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. Again, the words of Christ to his Father. Acts 20, 24, the words of Paul. Uh, again, none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. So the words of Paul, again, as he was uh, coming to the end, and he knew that the end was coming soon. So then, today we have to ask about ourselves. Each of us has to ask each other, or ask within ourselves, uh, what about you? What about me? We all have a course to run, a job to do, and a crown to win. There's a crown for all of us. And uh, the, the, the thing that matters here is, are we doing it as best we can? Are we doing it with all our might? Are we, going to, are we going to finish it? You know, so many people start something and then they run out of steam or they run out of interest and it's left unfinished. God wants us to finish the job. So we must, if we want to say with Paul, as Paul said uh, at the very end, of his own ministry. 2 Timothy verse four, uh, chapter four, verse five to eight says this, watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry, for I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course, I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. So I think we have to focus on those words and, and pray to God that he will grant us all the grace and wisdom and strength to be like Paul. Because at the end of the day, uh, when the Savior returns, I'm sure we all want him to look at us all and say, well done. Well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler of me over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. And that's the end of my message today. Amen. Our last hymn, uh, not last hymn, but our last hymn this morning is uh, 164. Lo, the signs are fast fulfilling. 164.
Dear Heavenly Father, we thank Thee that we can bow our heads before Thee on this very special day, this last day of unleavened bread. We thank You, Lord, for the past week. We thank You, Lord, and we pray that our, the efforts that we have made to remove leaven from our lives has been uh, acceptable to Thee. But we know, more importantly, the removal of sin, the removal of faithlessness, the removal of anything that gets in the way of knowing Thee. Uh, we pray, Lord, help us to banish it from our lives. We pray, Father, that Thou will uphold each one of us as we go through this next new year, that we will strengthen us, embolden us, uh, draw us closer together. And uh, we pray, Father, that Thou will uh, inject us with more of Thy Spirit, Father, so that we may flourish in Thee and in Thy love. We pray, Lord, for uh, like-minded believers around the world. We pray for those who are worshipping Thee on this very special day. And we pray for many others, Father, who have known Thee but have uh, slipped away. We pray, Lord, that they, in due course, will hear Thy still small voice and come back to Thee in, the due, in due course. Once again, Father, we thank Thee for Thy Son, for thy sacrifice, for the blood that was shed, uh, for being our Passover lamb. But we thank thee, Father, that thy son is now risen and sits at thy right hand. And we look forward to uh, the great time that will come upon this world. And we pray, Lord, that none of us will be asleep when the, thou do come and return to this world with great sound and glory. Uh, most of the world will be frightened, extremely uh, upset at such an incredible event, but we pray none of us here will be lost and will we be ready and waiting for the great tumultuous events that come upon this world at that time. Mm -hmm. Meantime, Father, we pray for protection. We pray for uh, strength to... Avoid the lying spirits that are all around us. We know, Father, Satan is very, very clever. And he knows all of our weaknesses and can prize open these weaknesses and, and uh, make his presence felt in our lives. And so we pray that you will help us, embolden us, and uh, be with us always, we pray. And so, Lord, with these words, we ask that thou will be with us, be with us the rest of this day. May we have a joyous feast uh, and may thou be a guest at our table. And we look forward to uh, the great and wonderful times when uh, we will be a guest at, the, at your table and sit amongst the saints of old. We cannot imagine such a glorious event, but we pray, Lord, that uh, uh, that will be possible for us all in due course. Meantime, we pray also for those who are sick and weary. We pray especially for mum at this time. Uh, we ask that thou will strengthen her uh, and uh, grant her peace, we pray. And so we ask all these things in Yeshua's holy name.